Um, so if you're interested at all, feel free to contact us for those as well. Hello everyone, I wanted to welcome you to another Grease Thief Thursday. Today we will be talking about heavy equipment and slewing bearings. I have the privilege of introducing Richard Janowski here today, who will be presenting this topic. Richard Janowski recently celebrated his eighth year anniversary with MRG Labs, and he currently serves as lab manager for MRG Labs. At MRG, he works in the laboratory analyzing grease and oil samples, preparing data for customers, and participating in research and development projects. He's currently ICML certified in LLA2 and MLT1. And here I turn it over to Richard. Thank you very much, Marissa, for the introduction. And welcome everybody today to a, another Grease Deep Thursday, as mentioned, on heavy equipment and slewing bearings. <clears throat> so, First, we're gonna start off with why would we wanna do routine sampling to monitor the health of our grease? So when we're doing our grease sample, we wanna make sure that the method is minimally invasive, that we're not going to be causing any disruption to the uh, grease itself. We wouldn't want to go in and remove too much grease. That's why the grease thief is used. It's able to remove a, just a small one gram sample when you have a full uh, sampler and we're able to complete all of our analytical tests with just that small sample. Um, we want the samples to be available without disassembling. So today we'll talk about two different ways to get a sample uh, from a slewing bearing, depending on what uh, options are available to you on the equipment. Um, ideally, the grease samples are performed between regularly scheduled uh, grease changeouts. That way we're able to sample the grease in service and get that real snapshot of the, the grease in the lubricating path. Um, sometimes though, the equipment may require purging and working of the equipment to cause the uh, grease to purge out. And we will discuss that uh, further. And also the method should leave the asset in a ready to run state. So we wouldn't want it to be over packed with grease or um, lacking grease, we would want it to have the correct amount and be ready to return to operation after we get our sample. Um, routine samples can be trended and they can help to understand the normal operation, operational conditions of the equipment. And they also will help to catch when we reach abnormal conditions when the pattern changes in our sample. And also, uh, with uh, grease sampling, there's a benefit because with your grease sample, 
you would be able to do on-site screening and on-site screening uh, helps to reduce the analysis cost overall. It increases the number of assets that are able to be monitored. And then it also helps to plan needed maintenance tasks. If you're able to find something and you know it's a, a problem, you can immediately take action for that. So re-greasing operations. Today, um, we're gonna show some grease sampling methods from a slowing bearing, um, but it's important to first talk about is just taking care of that uh, bearing or piece of equipment. And one of the ways is by uh, following the OEM instructions. Um, the OEM should or often does include a, a frequency and an amount of grease that should be used. And we wanna make sure that we follow this. Um, over or under greasing a component, um, as we know, can have a negative consequence by having too much or too little lubricant um, present. And then we also, uh, one benefit from grease sampling is that with our re-greasing re operations, we can actually uh, work to optimize that. And we would able to optimize the frequency that we're adding grease and also the amount. And the reason that the frequency and the amount would change is that we might have a similar piece of equipment. But as we know, uh, the same piece of equipment doesn't always do the same job everywhere. So with the grease analysis, we're able to really optimize for each piece of equipment and understand with its work pattern and what it's doing what lubrication is necessary to optimize that equipment in that function. So the first way we'll talk about getting a sample is if there is an access port on the bearing. So depending on the design of the equipment, the slewing bearing, there may be a access port on the outside or the inside if it is possible or you do have that, you're going to want to, as we mentioned on the previous slide, you're going to want to make sure you take your sample before you add grease. That way, when you go inside, you're only grabbing grease that was inside in the um, live action area and actually on the rollers doing the work versus being new grease that would have been added and then picked up when you're taking your sample. So we can see there the cover's been removed. I've highlighted it in red just because it was a little hard to see on the picture, but there's a sampler that's going into the um, opening and then that's gonna go in and uh, there would be a grease thief slim. If the opening is large enough, you could also use a T handle with a grease thief to go in depending on the equipment. Um, and that would be used to go in and actively take this or grab the sample from the inside uh, right at the rolling elements or your your lubrication area. And then with using our kit, we'll follow the instructions, get that in a grease thief, and then the um, sampler can either be used for on-site screening or it can also be returned to the laboratory for analysis. So then our second option for slowing bearing that we, uh, sometimes have to use is when purging. So for the example today in the video, we'll be using some cranes and that's this uh, picture is also of that from the video. So when the slewing bearing is in motion or in action, the body's on top and then the uh, whatever driving it around is on the bottom. So there's not access to the inside of the bearing and you can't get into the port. So for these ones, the option is going to be performing the regreasing per the OEM and then working the bearing and that regreasing in the correct amount and the working of the bearing allows for the new grease to purge the old grease that was inside out and it's going to come out of the seal uh, right on on the uh, edge of the bearing. And that's what we see there in the picture to the side there is a sample being taken and we'll show later in the video of that sample being taken. And as we mentioned there, the spatula has, has helped to remove the old grease that's sitting on top and is not representative of the grease that's purged from the seal. 
And then we're able to turn that around and using our pillow block kit, we would um, take the sample of grease. And in the video, you'll see we're going to fill the syringe and then the syringe is used to fill the grease thief and then it's ready to go to the laboratory or on site analysis. So we were talking about the low, the low cost on site screening. <clears throat> So the nice thing about that is that key parameters can quickly be tested on site while retaining the majority of the sample for future testing if it's needed. Uh, on site using the FerroQ and the grease thief colorimeter, we can test the ferrous, con the ferrous wear conditions and also have an understanding of how the grease may have been influenced by contamination or oxidation or aging in under five minutes. And then um, that data can be used to um, screen out samples if they are healthy or within the uh, set limits. And if they do not fall within your set limit, then you would have your outliers that may need uh, follow-up analysis. So there we have the uh, FerroQ, and at the end I'll also show this because I have the samples we brought back from the crane, so I'll show uh, putting those samples in just to show how quick it is. But it's our inductive coil, it's capable of measuring up to 200,000 parts per million, and it's uh, very quick and easy to communicate and export your data. We have our colorimeter. This allows us to quantify uh, using the delta E uh, value, the change in color or how much the uh, grease has darkened or changed while in service. And this is very effective for catching oxidation or contamination in a sample. I just wanna point out on that last slide or really the last two slides that you know what we can be thinking about here and that is from the color perspective changes in the condition of the grease. Uh, they could be due to aging and oxidation, or like you say here, the accumulation of contaminants. So maybe be a key to trigger us that, uh, you know, a certain uh, frequency of replenishment is either getting the job done or it's not, or maybe it's just too much flushing of grease in there so we can work towards optimization. And then of course the one before that with the furrow cue goes to the health of the asset. You know, and in these slewing bearings, you've got a combination of functionalities in the bearing as well as the gears that are there. And the idea that we can get an early indication of some issues that can later lead to damage. And we've been involved in some different projects, including a, a crane collapse where there was a failure uh, of the um, of the slewing bearing, which led to some serious injuries. And so being able to monitor this in place and add that to the safety consideration uh, and the health of that 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 asset is something that can be real critical. And then the long term um, optimal uh, operation of that with optimal cost input by optimizing the grease replenishment rate. Uh, both of those can be extracted from these uh, data test points. So just wanted to add that and I, I'm looking forward to seeing your video here. Thank you very much. And yes, on that note, next we will show our video demonstrating our sampling. So all of the sampling demonstrations you see will be from uh, different crane slewing bearings. So today we were talking about the need for uh, greasing the uh, bearing and working it first. So on this demonstration, this is one that we got. You can see it's in pretty rough shape as it was doing some heavy work on the job site. And this one, we did not re-grease and work before trying to get the sample. And we wanted to demonstrate that when we get in there, we're only finding this old stuff that was from the last purge on top. And we weren't able to get any um, new grease that was purged out. The seal's quite stiff. And we just want to demonstrate that if you don't purge, you're not going to be able to get a grease sample. <clears throat> so these next two, the second sample is from a grease or from a crane sling bang that was purged. This is from a 
rather large uh, 650 ton crane. So first here we're seeing is the large side of the spatula is used and we're removing the grease that's on the outside that was not just recently purged out and is not representative. And then we're using the other clean side and we're able to go in and we're able to take that grease and remove the sample of the grease that was just recently purged out of the seal. And it's a little hard to tell because of the, uh, the grease is dark along with the, the metal itself is very dark right here. Um, but the seal, the lip opens at the bottom there and it's kind of coming and squirting up from the bottom. So that's why Dylan here is getting his sample down below and making sure we're getting it right at the face where the grease is leaving that seal. So we've got enough grease in our syringe now. Yeah, Richard, I just uh, wanted to point out that um, I saw Dylan using the back, kind of the back edge of the spatula, and that's just to make it easier to transfer into that syringe, correct? Yes, that's correct. Because of its uh, curved shape, using the back side of it just makes it a little easier to get all the grease off of the spatula and inside of the syringe. Yeah, can you back that uh, video up a little bit? Because that was just a really nice technique that that he demonstrated right there to um, to transfer from the syringe into uh, into the grease thief there, where he was he was he was filling that to make sure you didn't get any bubbles and voids. Uh, in the grease thief sampler. I thought that was really good technique and it was really well shown on this video. Yeah, I think he's, yeah. Yeah, yeah right, so right there. there, right there we can see, yep. You're using the back side of it and as you push, you're able to kind of scrape the grease off on itself. And yes, as you mentioned, that allows you to connect grease to grease and it kind of wants to stick to itself and it allows you to get it all in there without adding any air bubbles. Yeah, and especially as it transfers from the syringe to the inside of the grease thief, his, his filling technique at the end there was real good. I think we'll see that here in a sec. Yep. And I know um, <clears throat> we were, we were at, um, on site at Manitowoc Crane, and they do uh, work with their uh, customers that are using the crane and that we mentioned earlier, you know, the OEM recommendations, and they make sure that they understand the work that the crane will be doing. And that's what they use to help determine the, the frequency and the volume of grease that they're adding to the bearing. Yeah, that was a real good transfer right there. Um, and you have a nice full grease thief. You've got probably, what, a, a gram and a half sample there? Yep. And then this is just a different crane. So the last time the seal was on the bottom and this time it's the opposite where the seal is on the top where it's purging. So we just wanted to get a different example of a different style slewing bearing to sample here. So again, Using the larger side of the spatula, we're going to remove that grease on top that does not represent the grease that was just purged out. Maybe now, expect. Now here we're, we're looking at the drive gear, correct? Th this is, uh, I believe the drive gear is right, yeah, right behind there that would like turn the on the sling bearing. Yeah, so this, this gear is going to be spun, and it's going to ride around in the ring or on the outside of the ring to pivot, correct? So this is the gear that makes, that makes the whole thing pivot. Yes. So really what, what you're showing here, which is neat, is that you can, you can see a couple things. This, this, this drive gear is going to have its own grease. It's going to have its own bearing, and you could kind of target in on that as well as take a secondary sample if you've got another access point of the ring itself and, and the, and the larger slewing bearing. Yep. And, 
the nice thing on these cranes, and I think a, a lot of systems are they they have you know one single point to go to be able to lubricate from. Um, and I know, Rich, we had talked about some uh, equipment. You are able to remove one of the lines if it's easy to remove one of the greasing lines, and that could also be a potential way to get a good representative sample of the grease that's inside the equipment. Yeah, and, and when, when you finish with this, take us back to about 245 on the time scale, and I think we can see an example of one of those supply lines, and we'll talk about that. Yep. Here, final step in the sampling process is just filling out your sample label. It's important to label your sample right away. If you don't label your sample right away, it's very easy to go back to a desk and have a handful of samples and to forget exactly which one came out of which location or which uh, equipment. So I just wanted to also show that on here of getting the sample label filled out and then putting it right on the tube so that we don't have any issues of identifying our sample. Yeah, that's great. You had that chance to do that. And Matt was there, was there able to help you with that. Matt Ensor of Manitowoc. Um, and we just happen to be close here in Pennsylvania, which is just such a great opportunity. Um, yeah, if you can so, drag that back to maybe about 245, I think it goes to the second sa sampling example that you had there. Maybe it's a little earlier than that, maybe about 230, um, just to look at that, um, at that supply line there. Right there hmm. at the top. Yeah, right now my screen hasn't changed at all. Mine says you're at 3.02, three minutes and two seconds. Is, it is the screen changing now? Do you see what you wanted, Rich? Right now, the grease is a little in the way. Yeah. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, so I, I think what I'm seeing right now, Richard, has timestamp of 241. And yep. you actually have the handle of the grease thief in white kind of pointing right at the grease delivery line. And so, yeah, that's what I'm seeing here. And I think what this shows is, so you'll have, I think you said, Richard, depending on the size of the bearing, anywhere from two to six on most of the, the cranes you were looking at with uh, Manitowoc, right? Yep, that's correct. Yeah, we've also done some work on very similar style bearings that may or may not be called slewing bearings, but they're in the wind industry. And so that would include your blade bearings and your yaw bearings which are essentially uh, slewing bearing, slewing style bearings. And um, we did uh, work with uh, some wind operators to generate an alternate method for taking samples. And in that case, um, <clears throat> where there was no opportunity to access a lip seal like you did in this example, uh, what we ended up doing was pulling one of the lines like you see here and capping it. So we pulled the line, put a threaded cap on top of it, and then added grease using the auto luber system while we were moving that bearing back and forth to add new grease and force it back out through that hole. And depending on uh, how deeply drilled that hole is, you might get a little slug of clean grease out at first, but then you're going to get grease that is being worked through uh, that bearing uh, channel, the, the, the travel of the rolling elements and bring you a sample back that's that's a really good sample that's a really recent and uh representative uh grease sample of what's going on in that in that bearing and i think sometimes folks think about these slewing bearings and they're so large and have such a large circumference that they're worried that well if i take a sample at the the 12 o'clock position and the problem is over at 
you know, six o'clock or nine o'clock, does it really tell me the story? And, and we've done some studies in the wind industry, which, uh, again, very similar uh, bearings. Uh, and unless your operations is extremely constrained, where you have a very small degree of freedom, uh, that, you, that you're just pivoting slightly back and forth on one of these bearings, uh, the, the rolling elements uh, redistribute that grease fairly effectively. And if we can get uh, to that area uh, on, the, on the travel of those rollers, they will, uh, they will bring particles around that whole circumference and uh, give you a good indication. So you um, can certainly do it at one or two locations until you get comfortable with that based off a given you know, configuration of equipment and operating style and so forth. Uh, but, but the studies that we published, uh, with, the uh, the wind industry in Denmark show that, yeah, that's, uh, does a really good job of distributing. And even that single sample you'd get out of such an operation, uh, tells you very much the story of what's going on, even for a fault or defect that is, uh, only in one location around the circumference that, that, that particulate gets distributed and that sample becomes a really good indication of the health of that bearing, as well as the health of the grease. So thanks for taking that back to that, Richard, and, sh and sharing that video. Yep, no problem. So next, I'd like to open it up to see if there's any um, questions from the audience about today's topic. So, so Richard, I just want to uh, clarify something here. If folks are looking for some some uh, references uh, and guidance on, on this type of sampling, this approach to sample, what can we do for them? Like I mentioned, the um, uh, the technical bulletin we issued for the wind industry, for example, which I believe has applicability uh, to components like we viewed today and other similar large ring gear styles bearings or slewing bearings um, is can, how can they access that information or how can we get that to them? I will make sure that I find it and then I can um, have that shared in the email, the, uh, the sampling directive, and I will make sure that that gets shared. Because that is, you're correct, it's a great reference to be able to see how is a good way to get another another sample from a a different style bearing that's in a similar application. So Kieran has a question of how do we ensure the homogeneity of the grease sample while sampling? So I could take a, a run at that. I think it's a great question. And I think it's one of the overall challenges uh, for grease sampling. And I think we need to start from the standpoint of recognizing that grease uh, generally is not homogeneous. It's just the nature of grease. And I think if we think for, about oil systems for a moment in their entirety, uh, typically oil systems are not homogeneous either. Right. We think about there's reservoirs, there's low flow points, there's valves with dead legs. And so at any given time, there, there's not homogeneity in an oil system either. But we endeavor to get that portion of the system sample that is representative, that is turbulent, uh, that is before it's been filtered and so on. So we kind of have to have the same approach to grease. And I think what's important is that we get into the part of the machine that's representative. Uh, for this particular application, um, there's going to be grease in here that has not yet made it into the, the working of the bearing, that hasn't yet been delivered to, uh, to the raceways, to the rolling elements and so on, or to the gear surfaces. And that we want to make sure is not what we sample. Uh, also, too, there's going to be um, uh, areas that have maybe once been uh, through or part of the wear system, and now they're just clinging and hanging on to some part of that system or they're in some corner or stuck to the surface and maybe have even been significantly contaminated. 
by outside contaminants that are not representative of what's going on inside the machine. And Richard showed us some of that with the first video that he showed. And of course, we don't want that either. And I did mention in a large circular ring gear like this that, you know, there's there's a lot of real estate. There's a lot of surface area there. And we could kind of hedge our bets here by taking samples from multiple locations and comparing them. But I think what you're going to find is that the action of the bearing itself has a mixing functionality with it. And not completely homogeneous, but sufficient that the sample that we get and take the same way from the same location each time, carefully as Richard demonstrated here today, or maybe even with um, some better access points, is going to be the sample that we want to analyze and make part of our uh, trending and criteria-based decision uh, values that we use for, for grease analysis. And then we have a second question of if the wear particles found in the sample are very severe, can the lab advise that the crane must be taken out of operation as it is very unsafe for further operation? Go ahead, Richard. Talk a little bit about what, what you do in the lab when you evaluate part particle quantity and then look at size of particles and severity and things like that yeah um the first thing the answer on this one would be is that it's very hard to make that decision on one sample because of not having the trend so it is helpful if you have a periodic sampling of the equipment and you're able to develop a trend and then you would notice a change in the particulate. So for example, if we're doing analytical ferrography and we see some particles, we know that, um, you know, for example, a crane, we've seen some samples come through where it's, you know, a 650 ton crane. So it's going to be lifting some very, very heavy loads. Um, and it just is going to be doing a lot more than a smaller crane. And it's also some of that is working with the customer to understand that. So I know when we were talking to the customer there, some of their larger cranes have larger tolerances inside the bearing itself and anticipating the conditions. So I think that also some of that goes to understanding fully the equipment. And so we do have some really good relationships with some of our customers where we're able to work with them, get drawings and that help, you know, the more information you have, the more you can understand and you're better to make that uh, decision. But when we're looking at the particles, we're going to look for that change. So if we are seeing some severe wear particles, how much are they or how, how many are there on, on, you know, on the ferrography slide? And then we would be perceptive to that change. And we would want to, if it, you know, we saw an increase, we would want to understand and go back to the customer and maybe they were just at a job site and they were working at 100% capacity of the crane load during that time. And they normally operate at 75% or under. So it's also just being uh, perceptive to the, the conditions that the equipment itself went through. But there definitely could be times where we could make the recommendation. I don't say... Uh, you know, we would make the recommendation that they would take action or consider suspending operation if we do feel like there could be safety uh, concerns. You know, that might come up to for more equipment related to transportation, for example, like in a, you know, in a gondola or a bull wheel or something like that. Yeah, I, I think you, you key on a couple of things there. And one is the quantity of ferrous debris which is what we have shown here uh, with, with the furrow Q tool. Um, and if we use that and, and we've established the normal values that we see for greases under certain conditions, like Richard, you mentioned that um, in your presentation that uh, the, the scheduled grease purging event could be the sampling event. And if that's the case, each time you take a sample, you're going to have the same amount of life and operating conditions on that grease. And so then we can compare that over time or even like look at, um, you know, a fleet of uh, a, a, fl a fleet of similar 
uh, assets and say which are the outliers in that fleet. And that becomes the first step. So you're going to show us a little bit here of, uh, of running some of the samples that we saw you take. Actually, where you had it, Richard, was fine. You could see the screen when that was lying flat. Yep, that's, that's good. Or it was. Yeah, it looks like 678 there. So um, yeah, you're muted right now. I was. So perfect, perfect. Show running our sample. We simply got our um, control dropper on top there. This is just going to ensure that whoever's dropping it, there's no influence and their sample's not catching the lip. I'm able to hold the sample in there. I'll go just slightly higher. You'll be able to see my finger. And then I'm just going to let go. Sample's going to fall in. It reads it. And then we have our response. So we got 671. So this was from the uh, second video that we saw. So this is from the larger crane. So for being that large of a crane, 671 ppm of ferrous material is very low. And then we'll get ready to drop our second sample in. Reading. And then we have a response of 156 ppm. So the third sample that crane is, at least in as far as where debris goes, in good condition. Can't speak for everything because I haven't analyzed it, the rest of the sample, but it's fair wear for both samples is nice and low. Right. So, so additionally, you know, so that could be a good screening test because if there's not much wear or the wear overall wear levels are consistent with what we've seen in the past or for that type of asset under similar loading conditions, we can kind of use that as the, as the screening process there. And, and you've gone into kind of a uh, flash mode there, Richard, that, that sometimes happens if you're able to correct that. Thank you. Uh, and then, you know, the the other thing that we talked about is what are the size of the particles? And that doesn't tell you that. That first content does not tell you that. It just tells you total ferrous debris level of all sizes, small and large. So that would be the follow-up step to that is to understand that and characterize it better by looking at the types of particles that are found, if they're normal rubbing wear, if they're larger fatigue particles, if they're severe contact particles. And this is all going back to Werner's question, which is, you know, can you really make the call to, to condemn uh, something like this if it's severe enough? And, um, and, 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 and again, it's hard to make it from a snapshot, like the first ever grease sample you say and say, oh, this is, this is awful and this is terrible. But we can say that the wear mode is noticeable, significant, and warrants further investigation. And it could be that you know, there's there's cutting wear, which might do, be due to contaminants getting in. It could be that there is highly tempered uh, and rubbing severe sliding wear particles that are indicative of loss of the lubricating film and high high force contact that's causing significant damage to the surface. And I think all that information coupled together, as well as having some multiple samples over time to see how that condition is changing with some additional time in the field will really help us narrow something down. But I, like Richard said, getting with the asset owner and understanding what else can go into that. And it could be looking at things like, you know, the load of the drive motor. Uh, and if there's, uh, you know, an amperage reading there, has that changed at all? Uh, is there any kind of uh, degree of travel that would uh, imply um, uh, clearances or tolerances that have opened up? Uh, other confirming type tests would really be helpful um, to, to make that kind of significant decision, uh, to pull that out of service. And I think even if you did have suspicion, the first step that you might take is some kind of maybe fiber optic inspection or something else that helps, uh, reinforce the idea that you're seeing with your grease analysis. Uh, there's some other, um, questions too. Uh, Karan also asks, is it advisable to remove the exposed layer of grease before performing the sampling? And yeah, you're right on with that. And that's what Richard did in the second section of the video or the, uh, yeah, the second section of the video where he used both ends of that spatula, the wider end, it was being used to wipe that outside layer of grease away that probably is holding the dirt and the dust 
from the environment and then getting the sample or grabbing that sample from the layer that exists below that. So good observation there and, and good point to make. Karen also asks about, do we need to look out for the additive depletion? And this is a this is a good point. The two screening tests that we showed, one was on the wear metal side, and then the other was colorimetry. That's going to look for, you know, maybe someone put the wrong grease in. It's a different color or appearance. There's oxidation going on. There's contaminants. There's breakdown. These can all have an influence on that color. But it's just a screening test that allows us to dive further into that. And one of the tests that we use for that is in the, in a follow up test is the ruler test. And the ruler test uh, we find that most greases uh, that we see in use in applications like this are being formulated with antioxidants, phenols and amines, maybe ZDP, some other functional antioxidants. They can be um, quantified very effectively in what the new grease is that's being added. And when we see significant depletion, especially when that sample is is being taken near the end of what is the cycle of that grease. In other words, the grease that's being purged out uh, because new grease is being put in. That extracted sample can tell us either that uh, the grease is aging, it's nearing the end of its life, it has a little bit of antioxidants left, um, uh, but, but not much. That would be considered ideal or optimized replenishment frequency. If we see that the grease that is being sampled or purged under those conditions is completely devoid of antioxidants and has maybe started to undergo oxidation, then it means we're not greasing often enough. And conversely, if the grease that is uh, being purged out um, is, you know, has 80% antioxidants still in there, that means it had a lot of life left in it. And if we look at that, and we also look at contaminant levels and the condition of the grease, the consistency of the grease on the accumulation of wear, and they all look good, then it's very possible to extend that greasing interval. And you always want to do that with, you know, consulting with the OEM on that. But, you know, we run these assets, especially something like this, under different conditions, different loading conditions, uh, different amount of time in the field, different amount of, amount of time sitting between uh, being worked uh, and so on. And all these variables can change uh, that, that aging profile of the grease. So we can use that. Uh, the additive depletion and these other indications to optimize that grease. And this might be one of the biggest cost benefits for grease analysis that really isn't getting a lot of looks yet. But we have two major examples that we've shared in some recent um, Greasy Thursdays. One is uh, from, from a military helicopter operation uh, where, where grease analysis was used to optimize the maintenance intervals or the regreasing intervals for for some 28 uh, greased uh, assets across the helicopter frame, resulting in about $10 million in, in, down, in, in, uh, in, in maintenance intervals and uh, uh, costs, saving that much every year of operation of that, of that fleet, uh, as well as robots uh, using that to optimize their uh, greasing activities based off of the conditions in the field and uh, how hard the robots are being worked in the environment that they're in and so forth and saving up to thousands of dollars per robot uh, in, in, in a given facility. So the example, uh, the examples, Karan, are there of using the grease analysis to do just that, to look at the additives, to look at the contamination rate, the condition of the grease and the accumulation of wear to say what is optimal and how can we, how can we tweak and dial that in. And uh, we have one more question there from Werner. Richard, can you can you address that? Yep, can. And the previous question was really good too because the additives are addressed in the standard for grease in D seventy nine eighteen, where you know checking for those antioxidants is a suggested test to monitor the the grease health. Um, so this last question we have uh, on here is when sending a fresh grease sample with the taken sample, where is the best place in new grease container to take a sample just on the surface or below the surface? Um, I think sometimes the best place to take the sample might be directly from the grease gun, because if there is a issue, let's say in the line of the grease gun or something like that, um, it would be great to know that, and we would be able to catch that when the baseline sent in and there's an issue. Uh, we, we did have a customer before that had a, a baseline that was being contaminated during production, and we were able to you know, find that by showing that the particles were in the baseline coming right out of the grease gun, 
and they were in the uh, used sample. They went back to the manufacturer. They took a sample right from the manufacturer, and they were able to find it. So I would say the, the grease gun would be a great place to get that. If that's not an option, um, you could then take it uh, from the container. But sometimes that could just open it to the container gets opened up, and then you can anything that settles on it while you're taking your sample could be collected as part of the baseline data. thing to that uh, when Werner's asking about this reference sample. And to a certain extent, we want there's two, two things we can accomplish there. One is we want this kind of absolute reference, which is the ideal, perfect, fresh grease that we're trying to, you know, reference things back to. And I think in that case, going to the new grease container and taking a sample just below the surface gives us that reference point. But I think what you're mentioning, which is at the surface of an open container or com what's coming out of the grease gun is also another reference sample uh, that we would want to evaluate in the lab. And I think I, I think I don't even want to call that a reference sample so much as a conditioned sample of the new grease supply. And I think both are very valid. But I think ultimately in the lab, what we want to be comparing things to is the ideal condition of the grease that we find uh, when we got to go subsurface a little bit with a grease sample. And by the way, someone asked me about that. Like, how could I use a grease thief to do that? And I did a little a little demo of that out in the barn a couple of weeks ago. And that's on our YouTube channel, where if you hold the grease thief just right, you can get that just below the surface sample uh, without too much trouble just with your grease thief and send that along with your sample. But I think these were great questions and really uh, prompted some good discussion. So um, anything to add there, Richard? Nope. Just wanted to thank everybody for joining us and thank uh, Manitowoc Crane and Matt Enzer for allowing us to get out there in the on, the, on site and take some samples to get the demonstration to everybody. Great. Thanks to everybody. Thank you for everyone for joining. I hope you have a great issue day. And um, just a reminder, next Grease Thief Thursday will, will be September 17th. And we will be using D7918 to look for cleanliness um, of new greases. So I will see you then. I hope you have a great issue day. Thanks.